All right, hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rebecca Poston. I know most of you. I am uh, the VP of Programs for the Harvard Club of Dallas. Um, before I turn it over to our host of the day, Van Sheets, um, just a couple of quick ground rules. And these are going to be as monotonous of, as uh, getting on an airplane and hearing you have to put your seat backs up. So you're, this is going to be familiar. Um, please, uh, you are on mute. So if you have questions, we want to hear from you. Please put them in the chat box. Um, and before I turn it over to Van Sheets, the president of the Harvard Business School Club of Dallas, I just want to give him a humongous shout out. He is amazing. Uh, about a month or two ago when he introduced uh, me and the Harvard Club to this potential event, I remember reading through the presentation and talking out loud to myself saying, oh my goodness, this is so interesting. Oh my goodness. So I said to Van, yes, please. Thank you so much for thinking of the Harvard Club of Dallas. Um, it's a, it, this is going to be a wonderful day. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Van. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, two years ago, my wife and I were at my last HBS reunion, and we heard Michael Porter and Catherine Gale report on their work. Uh, those of you who are HBS people maybe are familiar with this. It's a strategic analysis of the political duopoly and how it doesn't necessarily serve the uh, consumers, in this case us, very well. And what I remember about that, not only is the presentation, but walking out of it, uh, on the HBS campus in a little group that was just buzzing. But the question all of us had was, now what do we do with this? And uh, I only learned a few months ago that reform elections now was the answer to that question that a group of members of the HBS Club of New York came up with, I think about three years ago, when they had similar experiences. And uh, today we have three of the founders with us, Peter Cyrus, Herb Kaplan, and Mike Otten, uh, all of them are professionally accomplished and they all have deep histories of engagement in their communities and they're, they're personally charming, but uh, they're going to share with us what they've learned in this, uh, this journey of recent years. Mike, how about you take it now and tell us a little about the experience and to all three of you, welcome to Texas. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. And I'll just uh, briefly describe our mission, which is uh, to facilitate election reform through education and engagement with practical solutions that will enhance informed discourse, increase voter participation, and motivate better representation by our elected officials, all of which uh, were called for by Professor Porter as ways to move forward. Uh, as important as the 2020 election risks are, even more vital for us is not to forget them after the election, but to rebuild our election processes to reduce undemocratic political systems risks in the future. And you'll certainly hear quite a bit about these risks tonight. Our, our organization is made up of Republicans, Democrats, and independents working together to seek improvement in American democracy. Unlike many other groups bombarding us with political information and disinformation, we are all volunteers and have never included the word donate in our communications. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to share this afternoon some of our findings with the colleagues from the Harvard Clubs of Dallas. We welcome your subsequent involvement as well because we believe there are needs for systemic change that require thoughtful action over a number of years. The worst outcome of this year's election might be to forget too quickly the problems of 2020 and do nothing to diminish our resolve or resolve them for future generations. We would like to take a poll before the presentation and then we are going to perhaps to retake the poll at the end to see how your views may have changed as to what the risks are. Uh, we'd like you to take two minutes or maybe a little less to select what you think are the biggest risks for this year's election. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Allison and Chidu who will initiate the poll now. The objective is to pick the three top risks that you perceive as being risks for this year.
I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds. All right. We're doing on responses. Do we have a pretty good number? Yes, we do. I'm going to go okay. ahead and take a screenshot of this. Okay, we're to going to move now to the presentation or do you want can you want to do you want to show us what the results are first? Yep, we can wait until the end that way we can compare. So okay. I'll let you uh, this afternoon's you. presentations is largely researched and presented by Peter Cyrus with logistics and support from the, our core team as well as the Dallas clubs. Peter hates detailed introductions, but our team is indeed grateful for the intellectual depth, research, and communication skills that he has brought to truly complex subjects. Although he has authored many case studies in popular fiction and nonfiction books, there will be no book signing this afternoon. I will now turn it over to Peter. Thanks, Mike. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. And and can you see the presentation? Do we have the presentation up or not? We cannot see it. Okay. Then something we did this before and it worked. Uh, let me try it again. Um, Share screen. There's the presentation. Wait a second. Um, I had just. I we. I apologize. I had this all done. We had this perfect, and then all of a sudden, it went away. Uh, Uh, okay. Um, can you see the presentation now? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Got it. Sorry. Okay. So this is uh, the subject of today is how to avoid a black swan in 2020. So a black swan election, a black swan is an unpredictable and often catastrophic event that falls outside of the boundaries of normal predictions, but that in retrospect can often be understood. We do not believe that a black swan will occur in, in the 2020 elections, but we do believe that such an event is possible given the potential problems with political polarization and mail-in voting during this pandemic. In this presentation, we will consider how events could create a potential black swan and the steps that can be taken now to prevent such events from occurring. Okay, so on January 20th, 2021, Chief Justice Roberts gives the oath of office to the new president of the United States. <laughs> George W. Bush, the 46th <laughs> president of the United States. Now, I know that some of you are saying, okay, these people are pandering to Harvard and to Texas, because George W. Bush is an HBS graduate and he's from Texas. So that if we were giving this, you know, in some other city or to some other university, we would pick somebody else. But we're picking George W. Bush and we'd like you to understand this is not meant as a joke. This is meant seriously. And we'd like you to understand how George W. Bush is taking the oath of office as the 46th president of the United States. Okay, let's go to election day. 
Peter, could you could you uh, increase the size of the slides by getting rid of uh, what's on the far left of the screen and just going yes, to? Absolutely, I could. I could, and I would love to do that. So let me um, let me do that. We got it now. Is that it? Perfect. Okay. So there's George W. taking the oath of office. Okay, election day. Biden holds a four point lead in the popular vote. The news services predict he's going to win 328 vote, uh, electoral votes. Trump says there's no way that mail in ballots is going to be anything less than substantially fraudulent. It's going to be a great embarrassment to the country. In the next week, Biden's lead increases to seven points as mail in votes are counted. And Trump says the result of the November 3rd election will not be known for years. I, I think that mail-in voting is going to rig the election. I really do. Okay, so now December, November 10th to December 3rd, states count mail-in votes. In New York, less than 25% of the mail-in votes are counted by December 3rd. The rejection rates are over 20% and lawsuits are brought by everybody. Slow County continues to plague rejection rates in a whole bunch of, uh, uh, slow counting and rejection rates plague states in a whole bunch of counties, uh, states, sorry. And lawsuits are filed over the counting of mail-in ballots in 18 states, 11 Senate races, and 19 House elections. Now on December 21st, the Supreme Court refuses to rule on the legitimacy of the competing slates, claiming the election rules have been determined by the 12th and 20th Amendment. Now, if you don't know the 12th Amendment, this is uh, in the election of 1804, uh, after 35 ballots, Alexander Hamilton put the election to Jeffer Jefferson, and that led to his duel with Aaron Burr. Um, hopefully, no one, uh, none of the candidates are going to be killed in duels over this election. And the reason I say hopefully is, just so you all know, the Constitution does not have any clear rules for succession if a candidate dies before Congress has approved the vote of the Electoral College. So you know, on the did 20 you skip a slide from the you know, what happened in November? Because you went right to December. Sorry, in November, where were we? This was election day, okay? And in election day, yeah. Biden had a lead. Um, the next, it's the next slide. The next one, the next one. The next slide go. was November 10th, oh, you got December it. 3rd, the which was one. the it's counting right. of votes. The next okay, one. With a high percentage of rejections. The and next slide, Peter. What? The next slide about competing slates. I haven't gotten there yet. We think this is the one you missed, the December 14th and 18th. We didn't talk about that one. You went right oh, to December sorry. 21st. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so December 14th, I apologize. While counting is continuing in most states, the electors meet. Yeah, you're right, I apologize. Biden receives 244 votes from 23 states. Trump receives 186 votes from 24 states. Maine and Nebraska cast votes for both candidates that they do it by congressional districts. Six states, Florida, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and North Carolina are pending while the votes continue. So on December 18th, and these are all dates that are set in stone um, by, the, by the Constitution. On December 18th, the state legislatures in each of the pending states meet and appoint electors in accordance with the Electoral Count Act of 1887. Now, the Republican legislatures, and mind you, these states have still not finished counting. The Republican legislatures in the six pending states cast their votes for slate supporting Trump. The Democratic governors in Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania appoint a separate slate of electors supporting Biden. Sorry, here I got to the Supreme Court. I apologize. Um, so on January 3rd, the new Congress takes office. Senate races in Georgia, where there are two Senate elections, 
Texas, Kentucky, Iowa, Alabama, Arizona, South Carolina, Michigan, and Montana are still being challenged. This gives the Republicans 43 seats and the Democrats 46 seats. But under the 17th Amendment, governors can appoint senators, can appoint people to fill the open Senate seats until the elections are resolved. So the governors in Montana, Iowa, Arizona, Texas, Alabama, South Carolina, and Georgia appoint Republicans to fill the Senate seats. The governors of Michigan and Kentucky appoint Democrats. So Mitch McConnell is no longer majority leader, but the Republicans have a 51-47 majority. The Democrats, needless to say, challenge the appointment of all these Republican senators by the Republican governors because in some of the Senate races, they think they're leading. The Democrats, however, retain control of the House because unlike the Senate, vacancies in the House can only be filled by special elections and 94 seats are still vacant. So on January 6th, Mike Pence begins the count of electoral votes and announces that he has two sets of votes from a number of states, and it's the responsibility of Congress to adjudicate their validity. So the two houses of Congress separate to consider the competing slate. The Republicans in the Senate approve the Trump slates, giving Trump 294 electoral votes. The Democrats in the House approve the Biden slates, giving Biden 305 electoral votes. Both parties immediately challenge the results in federal court. The House of Representatives resolves to not invite the Senate back into its chambers for continuing the count until these issues are resolved. So on January 6th, with a conflict between the House and the Senate, Mike Pence instructs the House to select a president in accordance with the rules of the 12th Amendment. Now, right now, you would think that the Democrats control the House because they have more representatives in the House and Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker. But according to the 12th Amendment, when the House votes for a president, each state gets one vote. And at the moment, the Republicans control the House in that fashion, 26 states to 23 states, with one even, that's Pennsylvania. So, but this, but by January 6th, you'll have a new House. And in this particular situation, the Republicans control 21 states, the Democrats control 20, and nine are either tied or because of legal challenges have no representation. The 21 states controlled by the Republicans vote to elect Donald Trump as president. Now the law says, the 12th amendment says that you have to have a majority of the states needed for a vote. So the 12, 20 democratic states and nine even or uncontested states do not vote only 21 states vote. So neither candidate receives a majority of the votes of all states. Now, the Supreme Court again refuses to, claim, to consider the results claiming it's the responsibility of the Congress. Trump protests the actions calling it the greatest fraud in US history. Biden says he trusts in US government. The news media 24 seven is on the constitutional crisis. The Dow drops 8,000 points, protests and riots break out throughout the country, and Russia invades Latvia and Estonia. Now, on January 11th through 12th, in the Senate and the House, civility is almost non-existent. Republicans, representatives of both houses accuse the other of creating constitutional crisis. The Dow drops another 5,000 points, Trump announces that he's gonna serve another term, more riots break out. On the 13th, the Dow drops another 4,000 points, stock markets around the world plunge and there's more riots and shooting. 
So with the stock market continuing to plunge, riots throughout the country, a bipartisan group of senators and congresspersons meet to see if they can resolve the crisis. And they focus on section three of the 20th Amendment, which is probably something none of you have ever heard of. Section three says Congress may by law, if, if there's no president or vice president been elected, they can appoint somebody who can serve as president or vice, to, who can serve as president and vice president until whatever issues that have, have stopped the election have been resolved. So this bipartisan group resolves to find somebody to serve as president until the election is resolved. So they look for somebody who's got experience, who could step in immediately, and they consider Clinton, Bush, Obama, and Colin Powell. They eliminate Clinton because of the controversy related to Hillary. Powell's eliminated because he was never president. Obama's eliminated because the Republicans consider him too polarizing. So they pick George W. Bush as president. The Republicans are willing to accept Bush rather than Biden, and the Democrats are willing to accept Bush rather than Trump. And then they agree that Al Gore is going to be appointed as vice president. So after the Bush-Gore fiasco in 2000, Bush is president and Gore is vice president and the Dow rallies 7,000 points. And on January 20th, 2021, Bush takes the oath of office as president. Al Gore takes the oath of office as vice president. And in state after state, the counting of mail-in ballots and legal challenges continue. Okay, so then in 2022, the election is finally over. From February, 20, February 1st, 2021 until April 4th, 2022, the counting of ballots and legal challenges continue. On April 6th, 20, 2022, the Electoral College finally meets. Congress ratifies the election. April 20th, 2022, the new president is inaugurated and George Bush returns to his painting and his rangers. Now, the question is, how could this constitutional crisis have occurred? Is this just something that, you know, we've dreamed up when we're, you know, high on, on some sort of cactus uh, derivative, or is this something that could really happen? We think it's something that is not likely to happen, but could happen. Three factors contributed to this constitutional crisis, political polarization, which left both sides unwilling to compromise, COVID-19 and the switch to, to mail-in voting. Donald Trump is already signaling his 2020 strategy. He says, I'm not a good loser. I think mail-in voting is gonna rig the election. And to further cause disruption, yesterday, Trump told voters in North Carolina to vote twice by mail and in person. Send in your ballot and then go to the polls and vote. This is a brilliant concept if you want to disrupt the election. If even one person who follows Trump succeeds in voting twice because of a glitch in the system, this could open a litigation can of worms like nothing we've ever seen. It could take months or even years to review every ballot to ensure that people had not voted twice. Now, the problem with mail-in voting is not that it's corrupt or the problem is infrastructure. Democrats and nonpartisan experts have disputed Trump's assertions, pointing out that the evidence of fraud in mail-in voting is, is very small. They may be correct, but what they miss is some states do not have the infrastructure to handle the increases expected in voting. Without the, this infrastructure, it could take months to count ballots. Many ballots could be rejected, resulting in legal challenges. And as I say, if anybody gets away with voting twice, the challenges will multiply and final results could be delayed until 2021 or 2022. Now, even the Wall Street Journal editorializes about the threat. They call the New York primary a dark omen for November. And the Wall Street Journal says, if you look at the bottom, Democrats ought to be working to make sure that no one has an excuse to challenge the outcome. 
They should examine the New York voting mess and then take action. Otherwise, Americans might spend Christmas wondering which self-proclaimed president-elect will prevail in court. You do not want to spend Christmas with both Biden and Donald Trump claiming they won the election. Now, the New York primary was the canary in the coal mine. In 2020, the mail-in votes were 50% compared to two to three percent in previous elections. Uh, Jane, John Conklin, a spokesperson for the New York State Board of Elections said, quote, astronomically high number of absentee ballots overwhelmed the system built to handle far, far fewer. The system is built to process three to 5%, not 40 to 60%. It is not possible, sorry, it is, it is not possible to change the system overnight. And that's the point. The point is that we are trying to change a system on the fly that we can't change. Now, it took six weeks in New York to count the primary ballots in several congressional districts. Even if the lawsuits are settled and a lawsuit has been filed in one of these districts, if the primary results take six weeks and the final election turnout is five times the primary, that means the final election results could take 30 weeks to count. And current officials resign on January 3rd, leaving those seats vacant while the counting continues. Now, in addition to the time, the rejected votes are a really huge problem. In New York, in Queens, 25% of all mail-in votes were rejected. In the 12th district in Brooklyn, rejections were 28%. So here's what that means. If 50% of the ballots are mail-ins and 25% of the mail-ins are rejected, that means 12.5% of all votes are being rejected. Any candidate that loses an election by 20% or less will likely challenge the results in court. And challenging an election could take six months to more than a year. Okay, why are ballots rejected? They could be rejected because of signatures. How many of you remember how you signed your name when you first registered? I mean, I first registered, you know, whatever, 50, 60 years ago. When I go to the polling place, I can see how I sign my name, but if I have an absentee ballot or mail-in ballot, I don't remember how I signed it. Envelopes not sealed or envelopes sealed with tape instead of saliva. If it doesn't seal right and you put a little piece of scotch tape on it, your, your ballot is invalid. A mismarked ballot, a scratch somewhere. In Georgia, tens of thousands of ballots were rejected because people did not fully fill in all the parts of the X. Missing postmarks, this is my favorite. Ballots are sent in postage pays business response envelopes, business reply envelopes. The US Postal Service doesn't postmark these envelopes. Without a postmark, a ballot can be rejected. So you get, <laughs> you get an envelope, you put it in, you put it, send it back through the, through the mail, it shows up at the polling place and it gets thrown out. Now, there have been a whole lot of elections challenged over the years, and I've just picked three to focus on. In, in 1984, a congressional election in Indiana, the seat sat empty for four months over 92 absentee ballots. In 2008, a Senate seat in Minnesota sat open for eight months over 6,000 6,655 ballots. And last year, uh, in 2018, a North Carolina district sat open for eight, for nine months uh, over ballot harvesting, which was a Republican operative brought some extra ballots into the polling places. And in these races, we're talking about 92 ballots, 6,000 ballots, not millions of ballots. This year, each challenge could take eight months to a year and if there are a lot of challenges, it could take a lot longer. Okay, so let's see where the problem is. Nine states are really not gonna have any big problem. These are states that have 
all, all mail in voting or primarily all mail in voting, they've, you know, they have spent years and years working the kinks out of the system. There'll still be some kinks, but these states have them down pretty good. Um, sorry, get to the next page. Um, eight states are going to have an average of seven and a half to 16% mail-in votes. And these states, um, sorry, I missed the page back here. 11 states have more experience, but not for closely contested races. If you look at these states, you see, oh, they're, they're doing anywhere from 20 to 31% mail-in votes. They should be, it, it should be pretty easy. But look at the, two, six, two, the 2016 presidential election in Michigan. It was, it was decided by 10,704 votes. The same number of mail-in votes that were rejected in the 2020 primary, and as we said in the final election, if, if 10,000 votes are rejected in the primary, you're gonna have 60 or 70 or 80,000 rejected in the final election. Florida in 2018 had a Senate election in which the rejected votes exceeded the margin of victory. So most of the elections in these states should be handled, but closely contested elections, such as presidential elections in Michigan and Florida, Senate race in Maine and others, could result in challenges. Now, eight states will have problems in close elections because they do much smaller. They're seven and a half to 15.9% mail-in votes. And just as an example, in 2016, Hillary Clinton won New Hampshire by less than 3,000 votes, and the Democratic senator was elected by 1,017 votes. The, these are way under the margin of error for, for the mail-in votes, and these kind of results will be challenged in court. Now, nine states have less than 7% mail-in votes, and these states may have real problems handling the influx in 2020. Georgia has had huge problems with its new in-person voting system and is limited mail in experience. And they have two Senate elections in this year. Wisconsin's primary was a disaster and Wisconsin is also a, sp a swing state with a Republican legislature and a Democratic governor. And there'd be some other, that Texas, who knows, could be a swing state. South Carolina could have a, Senate re a competitive Senate race. There are some real concerns in these states. But here, these 13 states in DC, they don't have a clue. I mean, just as a frame of reference, these states had 31.3 million votes in 2018 and had fewer mail-ins than Utah did with 1.1 million votes. What you're asking a state to do is gear up from 2% or 1.5% to 50 or 60%. And as the elect, as the guy from the Board of Elections in the state of New York said, ain't gonna happen. And so in, an, in these states, you have a bunch of states with divided governments, you have a lot of competitive Senate elections, and you could have a real problem with the counting and processing of mail-in votes. Now, let's just take a one second look at Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a swing state. Trump got less than 50% of the vote and won Pennsylvania. And he won by 0.72%. Pennsylvania is a state where the governor's a Democrat, the Republicans control the ha both houses, even though the Democrats got more votes. And both Trump and the Democrats have already <laughs> sued Pennsylvania over mail-in ballots. Now, you know, when both parties sue a state over the same issue, <laughs> you have true bipartisanship. But in, in the primary, one, over 1% 1 of the absentee ballots were rejected for arriving late. 1.8% were rejected for signatures or other reasons. And this is a state where Trump won by 0.72. So you have almost 3% reject in a state where Trump's won by a quarter of that amount. We, we can't afford to have elections in which the margin of victory 
is less than the percentage of rejected votes. Okay, so what can we do to stop these problems before they occur? The election starts with the ballot process. There are four steps, sending, securing, processing, and counting. Very simple. Logic says mail-in votes should be easy to secure, process, and count because they arrive early. When they arrive early, people can inspect and process them. They can inform the voters that there's a problem and then begin the counting. Unfortunately, state rules make securing, processing, and counting these ballots difficult, time-consuming, and rife with errors. Now, let's just first look at the USPS. One of the greatest concerns is the mailing process. Ballots can be stolen out of a mailbox, lost in the mail, arrive late because of postal service delays, or rejected because they're not postmarked. And the new post, postmaster general has announced a series of steps to reduce the deficit of the post office. This has been in the news, and I won't even bother to go over all the things that, that he's doing. But it's clear the post office is hat facing difficulty. In Philadelphia, some neighborhoods haven't received mail for three weeks. In Maryland, some haven't received, it, it took weeks to receive their ballots. In New Jersey, ballots were returned to voters instead of to polling places or sent to the wrong town. And in Texas, just as an example, the general counsel of the Postal Service wrote to the Secretary of State, under our reading of Texas's election laws, certain deadlines for requesting and casting mail-in ballots are incongruous with the post office's delivery standard. This mismatch creates a risk that ballots requested near the deadline under state law will not be returned by mail in time to be counted under your laws as we understand them. So the post office is telling the Secretary of State, hey, <laughs> We're not going to deliver the ballots like you want us to. So the interesting thing is, so the next step is securing mail-in votes. And what's interesting is this, states with all mail-in voting solve this postal issue with drop boxes in which voters can deposit their ballots. They don't, in, in Colorado, Oregon, and Washington, two thirds of the voters take their ballots to a polling place or secure drop box instead of putting them in the mailbox. In King County, Washington, which is Seattle, there are 80 drop boxes. In Arapahoe County, Colorado, which is a rural area, there are 30 drop boxes. In, in places like New York City, there are basically none. Providing a secure drop box limits the risks that the ballot will be stolen, lost in the mail, arrive without a postmark, or arrive after election day. Now, second problem is processing. This may sound crazy, but many states do not start processing until the polls close. Now, one reason for not processing is some states actually get, give people a do-over. You sent your mail-in ballot, you change your mind, you can show up at the, post store, at the polling place and vote again. During all this problem with mail-in voting, COVID-19, we can't afford the luxury of giving people a do-over. If, if states pass laws restricting people who have voted by mail from voting again, ballots will be processed when they, will, when they arrive, and this will remove much of the time pressure on election day and provide much early results. Now, the next step, which is very simple, is inform voters if their votes have been rejected. If you send in a ballot, wouldn't you want to know that you, you, your envelope arrived with not fully sealed or that they don't particularly like your signature and they're rejecting your vote? The states that are experienced in mail-in voting, like you know, Montana, Oregon, Utah, Washington, they're among the states these states inform voters when their votes have been rejected and give voters the chance to correct it. But 37 states don't inform voters that their votes have been rejected. And by failing to inform voters, you have higher rejection rates. And when you have higher rejection rates, you have more challenged elections. This is just simple logic. It fixes a problem before it occurs. Now, the next part is counting mail-in votes. 
most states wait till election day to count mail-in votes because they're concerned about the leaking of results. But, but look, nine states allow counting of, of ballots way ahead of election day. Five more allow some early counting, and you've never heard of anything being leaked. So, and Texas, by the way, allows some early processing and counting, especially in heavily populated areas. With the influx of mail-in voting and potential threats to the election, shouldn't states allow early counting? Now, just here's a, a, just a chart that's a, that shows how Texas is doing. Um, it comes from an MIT study. And the only thing I basically want to point out is uh, Texas shows up 47th in uh, wait time. And uh, one subject that I just think is interesting, it has a very low rejection for mail-in ballots, relatively low, number 11, but a very high rejection for military ballots. So um, Texas is a state that, you know, I think cares about its, its soldiers. If they go to the trouble of voting, I think they want want their ballots to count. Anyway, there are nine simple ways that we see to avoid a constitutional crisis. Provide local, convenient, and secure drop boxes where voters can deposit their ballots. Provide extra funding for the USPS during the election period. Process mail-in voting, mail-in votes when they're received. Inform people if their votes have been rejected so they have an opportunity to correct their mistakes. Allow more early voting. Permit the counting of ballots when they're received. Hire more poll workers and contact appropriate government, co contact appropriate government officials and fix the loophole in the election system. We already talked about drop boxes. It's, they're not expensive. You could put one in every post office, fire station, and government office. It just makes life that much easier, and you don't have to worry about whether the post office is ready. Provide extra funding for the post office. This is a political third rail I'm not going to touch, but it does seem to me that if you're having an election, you ought to make sure the post office is at least relatively up to stuff. Processing ballots when they're received. Ballots should be processed when they're received. Now, this this will increase the cost a little bit because you'll need more poll workers, but you got enough unemployed people. And given the potential risk, the cost of counting ballots is relatively small. Inform people when their votes have been rejected. As I said earlier, this is an important step because it will cut down on lawsuits. Increase early voting. Now, I'd just like to spend a second on this because we didn't talk about this before. Um, voters and poll workers, many of whom are over 60, are concerned about COVID-19. States are concerned about the influx of mail-in votes. An easy solution is to provide increased in-person early voting at selected polling places. In-person early voting allows polling places to adhere to social distancing and people to cast votes without concerns for long lines. Many will select in-person early voting instead of mail-in voting. And we believe every state should offer three weeks of early in-person voting to allow people to vote safely and in person. We've already talked about the counting of ballots. Uh, the earlier you count, the earlier you will get results, the earlier you get results, the easier it is to avoid a, a real crisis. Hiring more poll workers. As we've said, you know, there's a great shortage of poll workers, but there are plenty of people unemployed. We should not be running this, uh, the, the election on the cheap by not having enough poll workers because the ultimate cost to the country is too great. And, and we contact relevant government officials, in every state, there's a secretary of state or somebody like the secretary of state responsible for conducting an election. In state legislatures, there are Senate committees and assembly committees assigned to oversee and set election laws. These people should make the changes needed to do early counting, to increase poll workers, to, 
to get drop boxes and do the other things we've suggested. And finally, you know, we've not had a truly disputed election in this country since 1876. However, there's some loopholes that could lead to the kind of events that we've described. And we think that Congress should take this opportunity to look at these loopholes so they actually never come into play. Um, so in conclusion, the election of 2020 is one of the most critical in our history because in addition to the presidency, the control of Congress, uh, and many states being contested, the election will also provide the basis for drawing the new political districts for the next decade. We are really polarized and we are in the middle of a serious health crisis. And many leaders on both sides are concerned about a fraudulent election. Look, we can't afford a disputed election and a constitutional crisis. Whether, you, whether you're for Trump or for Biden, or whether you're an independent, a Democrat or Republican, if we end up with an election with each side claim, with one side or the other claim they got cheated, it's going to be bad for our country. As I said, there are simple steps we can take to make mail-in voting function better and avoid the election results that may be disputed for years to come. Political leaders have to recognize these issues, allocate needed funds, and take the steps to avoid such a constitutional crisis. We have a responsibility as citizens to influence our leaders to take the necessary actions to preserve the integrity of our democracy. This is a song I've written, which I won't sing, and I thank you for attending the presentation. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start this second poll. I think that was what we were going to do next. So let me put that up. We're going to put the poll back up again and, uh, and see if people's views have changed is what the greatest risks are. Right. So let me relaunch here. Can everybody see that? I think we had a couple people that couldn't see it last time. And please vote for three, the three greatest risks. I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds. It looks like about 60% of you have voted. If you'd like to go ahead and place your votes, I'm going to end it in 10 seconds. Okay, polling has ended. Okay, now for the sake of um, the first poll, I'm gonna go ahead and put a slide up for y'all to see. Give me just a second. Can you see that, Mike? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. I don't know how to put these side by side without shrinking that text too much. So I'm going to go ahead and share the results of. Can you can you describe where you see bigger differences since it's still pretty hard to read? Is, Is it, there okay. much of a change from one to the other? Let me share these results really quick. Certainly, the uh, third from the bottom. The third from the bottom is the lawsuits filed by candidates or parties over 
counting or irregularities. And it looks like that one has shrunk significantly from the first poll. Which is the first poll? The first one is the big slide. Can you see it? Yeah. And then the sharing the poll results is on top of that. Okay. Are you able to tell? So the postal delivery one is going down. Fraud was never significant. Right. Delays in declaring winner. It seems to me uh, that in the first poll, the, 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 the biggest uh, uh, problem seemed to be uh, lawsuits. Uh, if, I, if I'm reading that right, and the, the yeah. second, the second uh, result just disappeared. I thought we had a different uh, different number one. So in the second one, it seemed, uh, am I reading this right? It looked like uh, the biggest factor would be delays in declaring winners uh, would be perceived as the, uh, as the most alarming risk. Right. I'm going to say that the first uh, uh, poll it wasn't clear that uh, you could scroll it to see options that weren't displayed on the first screen. So there may be some bias in the lower options uh, getting fewer votes than they would have gotten. Interesting. I would also mention, though, and the very low number of people that voted for the competing electors from state legislators or legislatures and governors, that is one that the political scientists and law school professors we've uh, talked with uh, seem most concerned about. Can we move to Q&A? Yeah, I think we should do that. Okay, let me go ahead and Hey, my name is uh, Herb Kaplan. I'm one of the uh, members of the core group of Reform Elections Now. And uh, first of all, I want to compliment Peter for uh, his fine presentation. Uh, it's kind of scary what what could happen, even though you're not saying it's most likely. Um, these are things that are possible. And uh, as we as we uh, look out, <laughs> I think uh, uh, it could be a little scary. So let me just look at the questions uh, that have been posted and, and uh, I invite you, uh, any of you to go to the chat box and, and, uh, and enter another question. Uh, the first one that I see is the following. If you process ballots before the election, how do you keep the results from leaking and influencing the election? I think Peter said that was, that was a rationale for not doing so. Peter, do you wanna comment on that? Yeah, I mean, look, it's pretty simple. Um, nine states have processed ballots way before the election, and there's never been any evidence of leaking. Um, you know, uh, all these mail-in, all, all of the states that are experienced with mail-in ballots, like Washington, Oregon, Colorado, California, the rest, they start to process when the ballots arrive. And, and there's no leaking there. It's a, frankly, it's a felony to leak. But I think that, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's conceptually, it sounds like, yeah, you could have leaking, but there hasn't been any evidence of that. So why not try it, you know, in more places? Here's another question. Um, I'm not sure about someone, uh, from the government uh, telling, telling me my ballot is not right. I, I assume that's a poll worker. Uh, then they know who I voted for and the whole idea of the secret ballot is gone. It's problematic. I don't know how you get around that. We're talking about uh, poll workers uh, opening up the mail ballots. Yeah, well, look, every, the way it works is this. Every time a, a ballot is open, there are four people looking at it. There's the poll worker opens the envelope. Another poll worker writes down the result. Um, a 
there's a Democrat and a Republican observer. So you have four people looking at each ballot. And they're, they're not looking at how you voted. What they're looking at is whether your signature matches. I mean, the, the basic thing in a ballot is, does your signature match and have you filled in the marks? I mentioned Georgia. What happened, Georgia bought all new voting machines and the people, the voting machines had a glitch, which is unless you filled out all, every inch of the X, your vote was rejected. So the question is, would you rather know that your ballot is being rejected and have a chance to resubmit it, or would you rather just have it rejected? Here's the next question. What is the counter argument from those in favor of universal availability of mail-in ballots in as many states as possible? It seems clear that many states are not ready to do it correctly. Yeah, and I think this has been the big issue, which is, I think, personally, I like the idea of universal mail-in ballots. I like the idea that um, the states that have done it for years have almost no fraud, Have do not have people voting twice, do not have people, um, you know, sending in hundreds of ballots. The systems in those states work well. And the question is, can a, a, another state go from 1% or 2% mail-in voting to 50% mail-in voting overnight without going through the learning curve that these other states have gone through? So I don't think the issue is, should we have mail-in voting or shouldn't we have mail-in voting? It's what can be handled in this election to avoid a catastrophe. Okay, here's a, uh, it's more of a comment than a question. Uh, well, comment is this, whoever wins, the losing side will contest the election and or declare it illegitimate. Get ready for a big mess. Yeah, and I mean, and that's that's really what we've been saying is, if we take some steps now, we can cut down on that likelihood. But I, you know, that's look. Do I expect that George W. Bush is going to be the next president? No, I don't. But do I expect that after the election? Who, that you're going to end up with gigantic disputes with people claiming, I won this, you know, with, with as, as we said in, in our example, with states where the governors appoint one set of electors and, and the legislature appoints another set of electors and it goes to Congress and Congress can't decide which set of electors. I mean, this is, this could lead to a constitutional crisis. And what we're saying is let's do what we can now to avoid that. I agree with your comment. Uh, this is a, a comment or a question that, that, I, that I have. Uh, you talked, Peter, about uh, uh, this being an infrastructure problem. And uh, out there are just, just uh, watching, watching the cable channels. It seems as though we're, we're hearing the message, uh, try to vote early if you can but also try to mail mail in early or even uh, even use a drop box. But if counting doesn't begin until election day or the day after election day, how can you possibly avoid the delays in finishing the counting so a winner can be declared? I mean, the, you, the reason for using a drop box is, um, the reason for using a drop box is that um, it avoids the issues with the postal service and it avoids things getting lost in the mail. Um, the, the, your issue with counting is a real issue. I mean, there's not, you know, the, that's, that's why I'm in favor of early counting. 
And that's why, going back to the, the last comment that was made, um, you could be sitting in, in December and in early January with states not finished counting. Now, this may not be, you could have a state like New York where you could have 25% of the votes not counted and you still know the Democrats are going to win, although they're congressional districts that you don't know who's going to win. But in close elections, if, if Michigan was decided by 10,000 votes, you, boy, you better count, you got to count every single vote to know where Michigan's going. And it's going to take a long time. Peter, you said that one of the recommendations is uh, to, to uh, get states to agree to start counting early. What is the likelihood that any state would do that? And, and what, what uh, power do the, uh, the uh, people have to push the states to do that? I mean, we're 60 days away. I mean, all that has to be done is they, you know, it, states, the state legislatures are still around. All you need to do is say, okay, you know, um, we're going to start counting a week earlier. We're going to, we're going to have a, an extra week of early voting. We're going to count ballots when they're received. These are not complicated issues. Well, it seems to me that there are, that there are uh, infrastructure and security issues in beginning the counting early, aren't there? As I say, there has, to the best of my knowledge, I can't find an example where somebody leaked the early counting. And frankly, if you are a poll worker in, you know, if you're a poll worker in Texarkana or, or Laredo or Austin, I don't know that the results that you see are going to <clears throat> significantly impact people, but, but you do not see these kind of, you, you have not seen leaks. <clears throat> I just want to make a comment. There's a, Nancy Schmidt um, wrote, why can't it be done online like the census? Mail-in seems archaic. Um, and I just want to say, Nancy, we did a presentation on the census um, last week and, um, or a couple, two weeks ago. And at the moment, the, um, the census is about 52% <laughs> complete. <laughs> so the, if the election is like the census, <laughs> we have even bigger problems. Okay, here's a, here's a question um, that's sort of related to one I just asked uh, a few minutes ago. What should states and the Congress do tac tactically uh, with a short time remaining in order to minimize uh, chances for a constitutional crisis? Is there enough time, practically speaking, for the states or for Congress to do anything meaningful? Okay, well, first of all, all the election laws are in the hands of the states. So Congress can't do, Congress can't do anything. I mean, they can start to look at, at all these structures of the 12th and 20th Amendment, but they're not going to get around to that. The biggest things that the states can do, as I said, hire a lot more poll workers, put in drop boxes, have early counting and early voting. They can still do enough things to make the process work better enough that it that a lot of these problems will be resolved. Peter, here's another question. Uh, who is responsible for fixing the loopholes that you refer to? Uh, it seems like each state for statewide issues and federal government for, for the post office, but who is responsible for fixing the loopholes? Well, it depends which loopholes you're talking about. The Congress is responsible for these gaps in the 12th and 20th amendments, then um, Congress then going to the states for approval. Um, the states are responsible for their own, um, for their own election rules. Um, I, I want to respond while I'm talking about this to a comment I see from uh, Steve Lowe, 
where it says voter registration lists are notoriously inaccurate, leading to many of the concerns about mail-in voting. I, you are so correct in this. Um, in New York State, for example, in they, they spend less per capita than any state in the country on keeping their voting lists up to date. And in 2016, they sent out 484,000 uh, requests to people and found zero, absolutely zero <laughs> registered voters. The, it is, as I said, the states that do mail-in voting have really up-to-date voting lists and every other state does it on the cheap and you end up with these kind of problems. And it, it is inconceivable to me that the states shouldn't spend the money to keep their voting lists up to date. I mean, they, people have driver's licenses, people pay taxes. The government knows who you are. So why can't the voting list be kept up to date? I don't, it's a very good point you make, Steve. Uh, there's a, a, a comment uh, uh, that, that uh, basically reads as follows, that uh, we basically should be using a computer technology with, uh, with pictures and fingerprints uh, uh, and then uh, vote online uh, with, with uh, certain validation uh, 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 procedures. It seems to me that that might happen someday. It's not going to help us in 2020. Yeah, and again, this is the kind of idea that... I mean, there is absolutely no reason why I, you know, I couldn't use my iPhone to vote. Okay, the problem is, well, there are two problems. The first problem is, if everybody's voting online, it's easier to hack. But the second problem is, you know, ain't going to help us in 2020. Um, I mean, it's, we have a problem in 2020, and... The, and again, without being partisan, uh, Donald Trump is saying mail-in voting is a fraud. The Democrats are saying vote by mail. <clears throat> and between those two positions, there's a lot of room for error. Peter, um, I think we've exhausted the range of questions. And so I'd like to thank you once again for your uh, wonderful presentation. And, and your, I always marvel at your ability to, to handle the range of, of questions. And I uh, apologize for skipping a slide. Can I make one comment? Uh, sure. Mike Dodge wrote, this is a good argument for direct popular vote. And um, I, I want to say that, um, you know, a direct popular vote sounds like um, a, a, you know, a, a fine idea. There is no way that a direct popular vote is going to happen because the, the way the Constitution was set up to protect smaller states, the smaller states that benefit from the Electoral College um, are not going to want to go for a direct popular vote. Our focus is how to make the system that we have better, um, even though, you know, Direct popular vote sounds like a, a very good idea to me. So once again, Peter, I'd like to uh, to thank you, and I'd like to turn it over to uh, to Van Sheets. Van, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, you might want to make some uh, concluding comments. Yeah, I was just trying to uh, get permission to unmute. <laughs> Well, I just want to thank the three of you again, uh, Herb, Mike, and Peter, for uh, joining us in Texas today and for a provocative discussion. The HBS Club of Dallas has, I guess, our most common theme uh, over the years in our programming has been business leadership, but we've defined it broadly. I think that involves societal and community leadership, and uh, this has fit very well in that theme. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Thank you all for coming and participating. We appreciate it. Thank you.